The following recorded program is part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center Lecture Series, offered by Mount Sinai Medical Center in cooperation with the City of Sunny Isles Beach. My name is Suman Narayanan. I'm a surgical oncologist, uh, cancer surgeon. Uh, and I just wanted to talk to you and about, about an overview of what you need to know about breast cancer, because I think it's a very important topic to know. So just a few words about me. Um, so I am from the Northeast. I went to medical school in Philadelphia at Drexel, and then I did my residency in general surgery for six years at uh, Rutgers in New Jersey. Uh, and then I completed a surgical oncology fellowship in Buffalo, New York, uh, at the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. So I've been all in cold weather up till the last uh, few months. I moved here um, in August of this year to start working at Mount Sinai Medical Center. So I am practicing surgical oncology, which can encompass a lot of different types of cancer surgery, but I tend to focus on a few things. Uh, my specialties uh, in my practice are uh, the treatment of breast cancer and benign breast diseases and tumors, uh, thyroid disease as well as parathyroid, so those are endocrine hormone secreting tumors, uh, as well as uh, soft tissue masses which can be benign or malignant such as sarcomas, and also skin cancer such as melanoma and squamous cell cancer, as well as a few other things. Uh, so these are just my offices. I see patients both up in Aventura and at the uh, Mount Sinai Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, down the Miami Beach. So just to give an overview of what we'll be discussing today, first I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the breast. What is breast cancer? The risk factors for breast cancer. Uh, can breast cancer be prevented? Uh, diagnostic tests and treatments and what you can do to try to uh, decrease the chance of getting this is just a, a schematic of what the breast looks like. So the breast is basically sitting on top of the chest wall. I think I'm trying to use the mouse here. The chest wall is made of the pectoral, uh, pectoral muscle, and the breast tissue goes all the way to the sternum or the breastbone and up to the clavicle. So this picture doesn't really show that necessarily. Uh, but the breast is made up of uh, a couple of different um, anatomic uh, subunits. Uh, it's made uh, mostly of lobules, uh, so where the mammary glands which produce milk during pregnancy, see there, during pregnancy, uh, lactation, breastfeeding. Uh, these glands here are the lobules which will produce the milk. Uh, and then the milk goes into these little tubes called ducts, which basically carry the milk from the lobules to the nipple where it's, it gets excreted for when a baby suckles. Um, the rest of the breast is made up of what we call stroma, which is a combination of fat, connective tissue, blood vessels, and also lymphatic ducts, which are also small tubes which carry lymphatic fluid, which contain the immune cells, and drain into, drain into these lymph nodes within the armpit. And so those are kind of like the garbage collectors of the, the body. You have lymph nodes all over your body, which uh, infections can drain to. They try to fight against infection. They contain immune cells. They can also uh, contain, uh, drain cancer cells, and so that's why we kind of have to uh, check these, and I'll, I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later on. So what is cancer? Cancer is the growth of abnormal cells, and that happens because every cell in your body is always turning over. And so when the cells are turning over, they sometimes make mistakes within the ge uh, genetic material called uh, mutations of the, the cells which divide. So when you have these mutations, sometimes the ability of those cells to stop dividing is hindered, and so it keeps dividing and dividing and dividing and growing and growing and growing. So that can lead to the development of tumors, and that's kind of what cancer is overall. Uh, obviously, breast cancer is cancer of the breast and can be uh, in different parts of the breast. The most uh, common is called invasive ductal carcinoma. That's cancer that starts within those little ducts or tubes. But it can, it can happen in any other kind of part of the breast, including the lobules, too, which is actually less common. So cancer cells, um, they obviously can grow, can spread into normal tissue, can cause damage to the normal tissue, and can also spread distantly, and that's called stage 4 metastatic disease. These are all kind of things that we have to, to think about when we're looking at any kind of cancer, but, you know, in this case, breast cancer. So what are risk factors? So risk factors are something that increases the chance of getting a disease such as cancer. Uh, some, can, some risk factors cannot be changed, but some are uh, modifiable, which means that you can do something about it. 
um, the next few slides are just talking about the main risk factors for uh, breast cancer. So obviously, gender, being a woman, is the most is the main risk factor for breast cancer development, just because women tend to have breasts. Uh, but men can get breast cancer. It's very uncommon. Uh, it's typically in about 1% of the population, but in certain disease processes, like genetic, uh, hereditary genetic uh, diseases, such as BRCA2, uh, men can get breast cancer in about 10% of the cases. So it is a possibility. So men don't discount, even if you feel a lump in your breast or that area, uh, it potentially could still be breast cancer. Um, breast cancer risk increases as patients get older, so the older you are, the higher, higher the chance you have of getting breast cancer. Um, a personal history of breast cancer also uh, increases your future risk. So a woman who had a cancer in one breast, breast and was treated for it does have an increased risk of developing a new cancer in the other breast or in another part of the same breast if they had a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy. So there are significant genetic risk factors too. So five to 10% of breast cancer cases are thought to be hereditary, which are caused by changes or mutations as we discussed within certain genes which are inherited from a parent. So the most common of these are BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Um, this tends to be more common in Ashkenazi Jewish population, but it can happen in other populations also. For example, the actress Angelina Jolie, I think you might've maybe you potentially heard about it, that she had a uh, hereditary BRCA1 mutation within her family. Her mother actually passed away from ovarian cancer, and so she elected to have a prophylactic double or bilateral mastectomy and also her ovaries because she had that mutation. Um, these women tend to develop breast cancer younger and develop more aggressive breast cancer. Um, patients that have a family history of breast cancer, as in uh, they have a close blood relative, what we call a first degree relative with breast cancer, also have a higher risk, even if they don't have a known genetic mutation within the family. So these are a few less common things. People who have had previous chest radiation, such as in the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma as a child, uh, can also have, have a higher risk of developing breast cancer later in life. Those treated with um, post-menopausal uh, post hormonal therapy can also increase your risk, and also recent use of hormonal uh, contraceptives, the pill, uh, can increase your risk, but then uh, the risk goes down after use stops. Uh, however, the actual numbers of the risk factors are a little unknown for the um, hormonal therapy and the oral contraceptives. We just say that there is an increased risk without knowing the actual degree that uh, breast cancer can be a result of these. So uh, in terms of race, uh, Caucasian women are more likely to get breast cancer, but African-American women get, tend to get more aggressive breast cancers and are more likely to die of this cancer, uh, often because of screening issues, but also, also because of the biology of the disease can be different in different populations. Um, the patients with dense breast tissue, I don't know if you've heard about these, this uh, terminology when you've had mammograms, but sometimes people have fatty breasts and some people have dense breasts, and dense breasts can not only kind of obscure uh, finding cancers on mammogram, but it can uh, be a higher risk factor for uh, development of breast cancer. Uh, and also, there there is an association with a longer period of uh, estrogen exposure without using the estrogen uh, for development of breast cancer. For example, uh, patients that don't have any children or having them later in life after age 30 uh, have a slightly higher risk of uh, breast cancer. Uh, those who have menstruation, menstruation early or menopause late, they have a longer exposure to estrogen. Uh, and so those uh, will lead to increased development of uh, breast cancers. So and then there are a few other things that the association is not really uh, clear on, but not bre uh, breastfeeding may slightly lower the risk of um, developing breast cancer, but also things which will uh, lead, lead to an increased um, estrogen within your body, such as uh, obesity, increased alcohol use, decreased physical activity can increase your risk of having breast cancer. So just be having an overall healthy lifestyle can uh, be helpful. So can breast cancer be prevented? Like I had kind of just mentioned, um, how you can uh, lower the risk is try to get out and maintain a healthy body weight, be physically active, limit your alcohol use, can think about breastfeeding, but as I said, the association is not really clear. 
and kind of minimize the hormones you put in your body. So uh, if you have an increased risk due to family history of genetic mutations, you, there are certain medications you can take in order to diminish the risk. So there is something called chemo prevention, which is taking certain medications which will block the estrogen receptors within your body. Uh, and that can be used, well, as I'll mention later on in the talk, um, as a treatment after you actually develop breast cancer, or in certain cases can use as a, a, prevent, a preventative measure to uh, block the effect of estrogen and decrease the risk of getting breast cancer. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, uh, with the example of Angelina Jolie, um, the, uh, some women who are at higher risk can get preventative surgery not just of the breast, but of the ovaries in order to decrease the estrogen within the body. Uh, and of course, screening is the most important thing for the majority of the population. It, it basically allows us to try to find breast cancer at early stages rather than waiting till you can, you can feel something or if you feel a mass that's getting bigger, those are kind of later in stage. But we, what we want to do is find things early so we can they're very treatable and cure. <clears throat> So as I said, screening is testing to find cancer early in people who have no symptoms. So it's uh, often in patients that don't have a breast mass. Uh, a mammogram can often find breast cancer in these patients. And to find cancers when they're small and have not spread, because once it spreads, it has a decreased chance of uh, being cured. Um, breast cancer screening is typically done with uh, clinical breast exams, mammograms, uh, sometimes in combination with ultrasound and breast MRI in certain cases. So these are just some diagrams of the clinical breast exam. It's basically just an examination of your breast by yourself or by a healthcare professional. So what you want to first do is take a look at the breast in the mirror and see if there's any changes from what you've seen before. Sometimes there's changes within the skin, uh, discharge from the nipple, uh, fullness or puckering of the breast, uh, lumps that you can see, or retraction of the nipple. That can sometimes, like those are all indicators that there may be a mass sitting somewhere inside the breast. Uh, and then uh, you want to do a clinical breast exam. This is the way I do it when I am examining, examining patients and when, how patients can do it themselves at home. Uh, so I typically do it while uh, patients are sitting up and then also laying down in order to uh, let gravity kind of change the contour of the breast. Uh, and then uh, you can, the manual breast exam is basically like, it's basically touching the breast in different directions to see whether or not a mass can be felt. And it has to be done all the way to the uh, middle of the chest and all the way up to the collarbone. Uh, and that, those are the, uh, the landmarks of the breast itself. And you want to check for, as I said, dimpling, uh, puckering, redness. You want to check for lumps within the breast or in the armpit. Uh, and when, if, when you squeeze the nipple, uh, if there's any clear or bloody drainage from the, from the nipple, it can actually be a higher uh, risk of having some sort of cancer or tumor within the breast. So those are things that we have to be concerned about. So mammograms are the most important diagnostic tests that we uh, use to identify breast cancers within patients. Uh, a mammogram is an x-ray of the breast. So as you can see here, the breast is pressed between two plates. Uh, to flatten and spread the tissue. I'm sure a lot of the women here have had them before, and I've heard that they're not very comfortable, but uh, it's the best test for uh, identifying uh, tumors within the breast, uh, as well as calcification, which I'll kind of get into a little bit. Uh, it produces a picture of the breast tissue. These are kind of examples of um, mammograms, and uh, women should start screening at age 40 within the general population. So these are just examples of what these mammograms look like. So the fatty uh, breast tissues are easy to see tumors because fat ends up uh, looking dark on mammogram. And so tumors end up looking white. So if you see a white on top of a black background, you'll be able to see it easier than in these extremely dense breasts. Sometimes the tumors can be obscure, uh, obscured uh, within this dense breast tissue. So sometimes patients with dense breasts may need further uh, testing with MRIs or all cells. So when do we do a screening breast MRI? It's typically not used for the general population, but in uh, women who are at higher risk for developing breast cancer, we usually say a lifetime risk of more than 20%. Uh, and we often use it in conjunction with uh, the yearly mammogram. 
And the MRI uses magnets and radio waves to make these detailed cross-sectional images. You can see here the image is much clearer than uh, on the mammogram. Uh, and this is a pretty obvious uh, picture of a, a, a large breast tumor. But you can also see lymph nodes within the armpit on the MRI. We tend to do uh, both sides at the same time. Uh, the issue with it and why we don't want to uh, do MRIs for every patient is that they're very sensitive. So they can often pick up things which turn out not to be of clinical significance and not cancer. So patients will end up having more biopsies if we, if we do MRIs for everybody. So we do it in patients that uh, we want to assess the extent of the, um, the cancer a little bit in more detail and or if they have uh, a higher lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. So what do we do after we find something abnormal on the mammogram or MRI? So we end up doing what's called a biopsy. Biopsy is just taking a little piece of uh, tissue and having it sent to the pathologist to take a look at it in more detail. So uh, the way we do it is a, I'm using this four needle biopsy. It's like a little gun that you uh, put inside the breast. It's a needle that has a, is spring loaded and takes little cores of tissue. Um, it's uh, used to take out these little pieces from uh, masses which are uh, cal tiny calcium deposits within the breast, uh, which may or may not be caused by cancer. Sometimes it's just caused by benign inflammatory um, things. So uh, we have uh, breast uh, specialists, um, specialized breast uh, radiologists who look at all the mammograms in detail, and they have specialized training in looking at breast images. So they are able to tell whether or not the calcifications look benign or whether or not they look concerning for malignancy. And that will kind of let us know whether or not we need to uh, send the patient for a biopsy. So once the patient has a biopsy, we leave uh, a, a little clip or a tiny marker, uh, which um, is placed into the area that was biopsied. So we were able to find it later when we need to do surgery. Uh, and so once uh, we, the tissue... Um, so we send the tissue to a pathologist who will look at the biopsy tissue under the microscope to see whether or not the, uh, there looks like there's any cancer cells within it and whether or not it looks like it's um, kind of dividing faster than usual. So that we can actually check that to, uh, with certain tests. Uh, one of the most important things that the pathologist check is the hormone receptor status. So we check for estrogen and progesterone receptors and whether or not the, the, if it ends up being cancer, whether or not the cancer is responsive to those hormones. Uh, we also check another protein called, called the HER2 new, which is a growth promoting protein, and that will allow us to guide for uh, treatment further. So um, I will get into it in a little bit more detail when I'm talking about chemotherapy. So I am a surgical oncologist, so surgery is kind of my purview. So this is the uh, decision-making tree when we, are, uh, we find someone who has uh, a breast mass or breast cancer. So we, we say, are we going to do uh, the breast conservation route via lumpectomy or partial mastectomy? You may have heard some of those words. Versus a mastectomy, which is removal of the entire breast. So for the most part nowadays, we uh, go the breast conservation route, which is basically uh, taking a small part of the breast uh, just with a surrounding rib of tissue around the, uh, around the tumor. Uh, the reason we do that is, number one, for uh, it's less morbid for the patients. It is, um, patients don't want their entire breast removed if, if they uh, can avoid it. And we've, um, with various clinical trials, found that with a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy with the addition of radiation versus mastectomy or removal of the entire breast, there's no difference in survival after uh, developing breast cancer. There can be a slightly higher increased risk of uh, local recurrence, which is basically the cancer coming back within the same breast or the opposite breast, and that's just because you still have some breast tissue left. Uh, the mastectomy is uh, removal of the entire breast, so typically we uh, will do that if with an elliptical incision around the nipple and areola. And uh, we take all of this breast tissue uh, off the chest wall here. 
uh, if the um, if the tumor is further away from the nipple, sometimes we're able to uh, spare the nipple. It's called nipple sparing mastectomy, and uh, we do that pretty frequently also. Uh, and that's usually if patients are uh, if the cancer is further away from the nipple and not involved with it, and if the patient's going to have a uh, reconstruction. <laughs> so that's something we discussed too. So. In terms of the logistics of doing the lumpectomy, so that little clip that they leave during the biopsy, that's a marker for the radiologist to place another marker that we can uh, find in the operating room. It's often a needle or it's a uh, potentially a, a radiofrequency seed. We have those both at um, Mount Sinai. And those allow us to find out exactly where that little clip is that, so we can take a bigger rim of tissue around it. Uh, and we make the incision right on top of that area or sometimes around the nipple, sometimes uh, closer to the armpit in order to try to hide it a little bit better. It depends on where the um, main cancer is. So the next important thing is, has the breast cancer spread to the axillary underarm lymph nodes? So those are things that we have to also investigate in the operating room. So as you can see here, like I said, the, the lymph nodes and the lymphatic uh, channels are kind of the garbage, garbage man of the um, body. So they take any infections, they take any cancer cells, and uh, they become, if there's cancer within the body, then the, the lymph nodes can sometimes become full of cancer cells. So we want to check that within the operating room. So the way we do that is by doing what's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, where we inject radioactive uh, dye or a blue dye near the tumor. Uh, and it spreads via these lymphatic channels to the lymph nodes within the armpit. Uh, lymph nodes within the armpit. And the first lymph node that the uh, cancer would drain to if it did spread uh, is called the sentinel node. Um, we, in the old days of treatments of breast cancer, most women used to have these axillary lymph node dissections, which is removal of all of the lymph nodes within the armpit. Uh, however, we found that those uh, tend to lead to a lot of arm swelling and lymphedema. Uh, so we tried, or we've tried over the several years of breast cancer treatment and clinical trials to decrease the amount of times that we are required to do this axillary lymph node dissection. So nowadays, even if there are some uh, cancer cells within the lymph nodes that we find during sentinel lymph node biopsy, if it's two or less, and if it's not extended beyond the lymph nodes, we tend to not do an axillary lymph node dissection. However, if there's more axillary nodes that we find, if they're matted, if, they, uh, if there's more concern to them, there's certain other criteria, if there's three or more, then we will uh, do a completion axillary node dissection, which is basically removal of as many of the lymph nodes as we can find. It has to be ideally more than 10 to see whether or not there's uh, any uh, lymph nodes which are involved. There's lymph nodes that are involved, that's called stage three disease. Um, and uh, so some patients have um, positive lymph nodes or enlarged lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis of their breast cancer originally. Some of those patients uh, were able to give chemotherapy and shrink everything down and won't necessarily need an axillary dissection, but if the lymph nodes are still big after chemotherapy, we uh, will proceed with the axillary lymph node dissection. So this may be a little bit more detail than uh, you necessarily need to know, but um, it's kind of our decision-making process as surgeons as, and treatment and, and doctors who treat this kind of cancer. So reconstruction is very commonly done after mastectomy for breast cancer. That's just to reconstruct the shape of the breast. Uh, it's usually done with the with um, breast implants. Um, most women who have not had previous breast implants will often need to have what's called a tissue expander placed at the time of their original surgery. That's placed behind the, the chest wall pectoral muscle in order to increase the space. And so once that space has been increased over several months, the, uh, that can be replaced with a breast implant. So this is done with plastic surgeon at the time of the original surgery. And so plastic surgeons tend to be the, the surgeons who will follow up and do further surgeries if need be. Uh, and then there's always a possibility of having uh, muscle flaps that are done to try to reconstruct the breast and chest wall. Uh, these can be taken from the abdominal wall from the back and sometimes uh, fat transfer from the bottom or different locations. So there's a lot of different types of reconstruction methods that 
can be several entire talks uh, that can be given by plastic surgeons. So we as cancer doctors, cancer surgeons work in conjunction with um, with uh, cancer surgeons, uh, with um, plastic surgeons in order to uh, you know reconstruct the shape of the breast after um, we remove the cancer. Uh, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about treatment with radiation and chemotherapy. So, radiation is uh, most commonly done after breast conservation surgery or lumpectomy uh, to lower the chance of having cancer occurrence. It's a local treatment, so it does it would not prevent cancer cells from going to other parts of the body other than recurring at the same chest wall. Um, it can it's tip, we typically do it for all patients who have a lumpectomy. Uh, who had pre-invasive cancer or invasive cancer. However, it is sometimes done after mastectomy too. It's not done all the time after the entire breast is removed. So typically after the entire breast is removed, patients don't need radiation, but there are certain circumstances in which they will. So that's uh, typically if they have larger tumors, if they have cancer in the lymph nodes, if they have uh, invasion of the skin. Um, those are indicators that the patient would need radiation after uh, mastectomy. And the way radiation is done, we refer to a radiation oncologist who are specialists in this uh, field. Uh, radiation is given to the whole uh, chest wall, typically five days a week and five to six weeks. It's, it's pretty well tolerated. Uh, most people don't tend to have a lot of side effects of it, but it can cause some uh, swelling within the breast uh, and skin changes which look like a uh, sunburn. So, but those tend to go away and sometimes patients complain of just fatigue after, with radiation. But uh, generally speaking, it's uh, pretty well tolerated. Chemotherapy is uh, used to kill any cancer cells which may have been left behind um, or have spread but can't be seen. So it's for the cells that, the local treatments are surgery and radiation, so try to kill all the cancer cells that we can see. Chemotherapy is to kill the cancer cells that we can't see. Uh, this can be given before or after surgery. So like I said, sometimes people with uh, bigger tumors within the breast or uh, enlarged lymph nodes within the armpit can get chemotherapy to try to shrink everything down and prevent it from spreading um, before we go towards surgery. Um, a lot of patients uh, are now given uh, chemotherapy after surgery, but it's again becoming less nowadays than it used to be. So most women with breast cancer used to get chemotherapy just across the board. So now we're doing much more genetic testing of the tumors itself to see their, to uh, formulate a prognostic score to see whether or not there's a higher chance of it coming back or spreading. So if the prognostic score is higher, then we will give chemotherapy. If it's lower or intermediate, then we won't give chemotherapy now. So that's a, um, those are determinations that are typically made by the medical oncologists um, when, that we refer to before or after surgery. Uh, chemotherapy is usually given intravenously or through a central venous uh, port or catheter, which is placed um, by surgeons or radiologists. Uh, typically given in two to three week cycles for a total of three to six months. So there's a variety of different regimens with different side effects that can be given. Uh, and it's usually up to the uh, medical cancer doctors to determine whether or not which ones to give and why not to give one versus another. Uh, but some common side effects that you probably have heard of before are hair loss, mouth sores, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Those are usually um, uh, controlled with medications. Um, and uh, there, there are a few others depending on which kind of chemotherapy uh, you get. So th this is kind of where the uh, importance of the receptor status also comes in. Uh, patients that have or have triple negative tumors or have uh, don't have the estrogen responsiveness and don't have that HER2 new protein tend to be more responsive to chemotherapy. So those patients tend to get chemotherapy versus patients who have that estrogen positivity. They don't necessarily always get chemotherapy. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. And like I said, that there is that protein HER2 new, which is a growth promoting protein. If patients have, the, have a tumor with that positive, then there are medications that are specifically targeted against that protein. And so those patients will tend to get chemotherapy. So that's why we always check the receptor status when we're doing the biopsy uh, in order to guide further treatment.
And um, kind of like I said about the chemo prevention, we also give uh, medications to block the estrogen or hormone receptors. Um, some, like I said, some uh, breast cancer are affected by these estrogen and progesterone um, receptors, uh, and those are called ERPR positive. Those we can give medications to block the estrogen from getting to the receptor or block the production of estrogen, depending on uh, which medication you get. So there are different medications that are given to women uh, with breast cancer who are pre- and postmenopausal. Premenopausal women tend to get a medication called tamoxifen, um, and it can has some side effects, um, such as uh, it rarely getting clot, clots, clots in the legs. It does have a higher chance of getting endometrial cancer. Can give you some hot flashes, um, but the medications can be changed around for whether or not they're uh, given to pre- or postmenopausal women. They also they all have different side effect profiles. Uh, these are typically given four or five years after initial treatment. It's for women who have these estrogen and progesterone receptor positivity to decrease chance of having the cancer come back. So um, it has a lot, all of these medications have been found to decrease the local and distant recurrence of uh, these estrogen producing cancers. So what can you do? Uh, stay healthy, exercise, maintain a healthy weight, limit alcohol use. Uh, you want to do breast ex get breast exams every year by your physician, typically by a primary care doctor or a gynecologist. Um, a lot of women do self breast exams every month just to see whether or not there's any changes within their breast. Um, this is kind of uh, controversial as to whether or not it actually decreases the chance of getting breast cancer, but I've known uh, several women who found uh, lumps within their breast, um, which has allowed them to get further treated. Uh, and then screening is uh, very important, too, uh, in terms of getting mammograms or MRI in high-risk patients to, um, to see things that we can't feel on exam or, um, you know, not clinically evident. We want to find things that are much smaller or earlier stage. Uh, and then once uh, something's found on the imaging studies, um, see a cancer physician. So we are a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we have a full cancer center with a surgical oncologist, such as myself, medical doctor, medical oncologist who give the chemotherapy and the hormone, anti-hormone therapy, and radiation oncologist. So we all, we work together and we work with the uh, breast specialist med or radiologist and breast specialist pathologist as a team. Uh, we discuss uh, patients every week and um, get the best treatment uh, algorithm that's individualized for each patient. So I think that's uh, kind of important for um, all cancer treatment, um, but including breast cancer. So these are a few references. The American Cancer Society is a very good resource. The NCCN uh, guidelines have a lot of patient resources for patients who have been diagnosed. So there's a lot of good uh, resources on the web if you want to read further. And I uh, thank you, and I'll take any further questions. <laughs> I think it's around 15 to 20 percent of the uh, popula population can get 10 to 15 percent maybe of the uh, women get breast cancer at higher risk in certain other populations. Ashkenazi Jewish population gets a much higher degree. Um, but it can happen to any woman, but any women. It's the most common cancer in women. What about I don't think there's been any evidence to, uh, to suggest that bras uh, can cause breast cancer or don't cause breast cancer. A lot of women actually come, come to me and say, should I be wearing a bra? Should I not be wearing a bra? Or uh, now that I have this lesion, should I not, you know? But there's been no evidence that bras have any impact on breast cancer. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it's the thing is we get screened a lot in this country. So, uh, you know, we we suggest that women get screened at age 40, and a large popular percentage of the population actually does do that. Are they in certain other societies getting mammograms at age 40 every year? Probably not, based on you know socioeconomic concerns and financial things and access. So, with those those questions, it's difficult to answer. There was a situation after 11 years, 
in which the breast became red and somewhat itchy in the nipple. Mm -hmm. And no matter who I had gone to, at least five doctors, mm -hmm. none of them could determine why. Three biopsies were taken, mm -hmm. and it did not show cancer returning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't use deodorant. I never okay. need to use deodorant since okay. surgery. And I don't wear brassiers with wires, regardless okay. of whether it's good or not. Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, those are things. People who have asked me if, people should, if, you should wear, if I should wear a deodorant or if I should have underwire bras. I think there's been no evidence to suggest that either of those well, things can cause cancer. I mean, in terms of the... Um, the skin changes, did you have radiation after? The 25 bouts of it, but the radiation has caused, could be the cause of that situation, but so it's so many, it so many years later. Right. The thing is that what the radiation did cause is um, whenever it's humid, mm -hmm. the breast has this humidity under the breast line and causes redness and itch and you need to use some kind of a cortisone in order to stop the itch because it's very severe and yeah. it's often depends on the weather depends on the situation but using cold water is better in a shower there than hot water. okay yeah i mean i think I think certainly radiation can cause some changes to the skin, like a sunburn. Even, I mean, we've noticed that radiation can cause uh, damage to the skin and other even parts of the body, even many years later. Uh, what we do have to keep an eye on, there's something called Paget's disease, which is basically, it can have um, some peeling of the skin around the nipple. So those can sometimes have tumors that are underlying, that are hidden. And the only manifestation of it is, is caused by that, um, you know, Kind of desquamating of the, the nipple and peeling. So that's something why you have to. How do you spell it? P A G E T apostrophe S. So that's just the nipple. It's a get very. There are several different types of patches disease. A little hard. And then go back. I mean, sometimes there can be different swelling in the breast. It may be caused by radiation. I mean, it's something that you have to keep an eye on. I mean, there are changes in the breast. I mean, I assume you had a lumpectomy and and radiation. Sometimes that change in the contour of the breast will have fluid kind of sitting there and having a new capsule made in order to try to replace that area. So that in itself can change the contour of the breast and sometimes can pucker in the nipple. So why it changes on a monthly basis is hard to know. Sometimes it's just based on the fluid and inflammation that's in there. It's hard for me. To, it's it's hard for me to answer why that's exactly happening. I think just sometimes after treatment, there's a change in the contour of the breast and uh, whether or not there's you know, fluid still sitting there, inflammatory cavities, and different things. Uh, I have a question on the tamoxifen. Yes. Is the protocol only five years in the U.S. because it seems to be much longer in Canada? So, My wife has been on that for ten years. Uh -huh. And so, what happens after? Well, typically, it's, uh, we still suggest five years. The guidelines that we, as, a, um, as cancer doctors, have come up with, it's called the NCCN uh, guidelines from the Commission on Cancer. Uh, they say you can increase up to 10 years in certain circumstances, so I think it probably depends for each patient. Um, I, I'm not sure about the screening protocols in Canada versus the United States. I think at a certain point, you don't want to keep giving medications to block the hormones, because these medications still do have side effects too. Um, so I think a lot of treatment is individualized based on uh, your type of cancer and um, what your medical oncologist kind of thinks is the most appropriate uh, degree of treatment. But so what do, do they do after, what do they do after the five years or the 10 Sc years? Screening. So. Just screening, no medication. Yeah. Thank you. After all the years and money, billions of dollars spent on cancer research, yeah. uh, how, will, how will we come in along with it? It doesn't seem well, any if you much think, breaks, uh, breakthrough. Well, if you think about breast cancer treatment now compared to 20 years ago, it's, it's changed by leaps and bounds. I mean, 
the surgical treatments uh, alone, I mean, we, we tend to do much more minimally invasive surgery. We do uh, the least amount possible. We do take fewer lymph nodes. People have fewer side effects based on it. Um, a lot of the, met the, the research funding goes into development of new medications, and it tends to be people with more advanced disease. Uh, so, like I said, there's uh, several medications to treat to target that her to new uh, receptor, which could increase the survival of patients with that um, growth promoter, which is, you know, previously, un if, un if untreated, much more aggressive. Um, but there's also several medications used to treat people with metastatic disease, with different hormone receptor status, and different things. So I, I think it definitely is much better than it used to be, and a lot of it is based on, you know, more genetic testing, more targeted therapies, and those kind of things. So, I mean, the, the thing is, people say, when are we going to cure cancer? But cancer is so many different diseases. You know, even breast cancer is many different diseases. Each breast cancer has different biology, different genetic profile, and we're kind of just more getting into that um, stage of the science. When do you think that there will be a cure for breast cancer? Is, that's, there, that's, is there anything in the horizon? Well, I mean, that's, us that's, women are suffering. I'm, I, I'm with you. <laughs> um, I, it, I, again, it's hard to predict. I mean, people, some people are just cured with breast cancer. If they have a smaller cancer, they had estrogen uh, receptor positive, uh, positivity status, they had surgery, they had radiation or plus minus chemotherapy, they can live for another 20, 30 years, and that's what we consider to be cure. You know, I mean, I mean, for certain diseases, five year survival is almost, you know, Possible, but breast cancer people can be treated and live the rest of their life, and that we, that's kind of what we consider cure. So, I mean, it really depends on how big the cancer was, how aggressive the cancer was. It's not, it's hard to think of uh, breast cancer as one specific disease. I mean, I think we're definitely on the right path, but when all breast cancer is going to be, you know, curative, it's it's hard to say that too because people are diagnosed at different stages, etc. Along those lines, I have two friends that got breast cancer back after nine and ten years. Exactly. Which was surprising. Well, exactly. I myself so. had ovarian, and I'm still going for years. I'm sorry to hear. It's, it's just, uh, I mean, that's why we kind of continue screening for a long period of time. Breast cancer, we don't think of in five years, and that's... Yeah, that's it. We stop screening, and we have to. We just keep going until, as long as uh, patients are still able to tolerate treatment, if they do have a recurrence, then we will just continue screening up to that point. Because people can have recurrence twenty, up to twenty years um, of an uh, original treatment. It happens not infrequently. Uh, some people cannot use tamoxifen, yeah. and there are other medications that are used for the five years. In my case, I did not use tamoxifen. Or or yes, and it, I did that for five years. But also, uh, 14 lymph nodes were removed because I was considered number two on cancer. Mm -hmm. um, however, the fluid may have something to do with what effect it has in the bus. The problem is it's at least 11 years, and this occurred after the 11 years, and the Good other, the yeah, the other, the redness is what I talked about, but the bus, um, the, the other bus, nothing has occurred in the bus at all. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, that's why, I mean, but there is something I might suggest, I don't know if they do that here. Sure. Every year that you go, they maintain the information from the ultrasound and the mammogram. And the following year, they check that against what you now take the second year. Yeah. And they continue that over the years to see if there is any change. But some changes are not very evident. Mm -hmm. It could be something that seems uncomfortable mm -hmm. but doesn't show really much. And then a biopsy is used and then they can find it. Yeah, I mean, that's why I, I, I take your point that it's important to have consistency in the, the people that you see or they, we all, we have they look medical back a few years to, to yeah. check to see what's going on. But this is maintained by the hospital. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we typically look at people's previous uh, reports and their imaging studies to see whether if they had something, is it getting bigger, is it stable, uh, is it getting smaller. We sometimes um, are watching, you know, benign uh, entities, so those are important to do. I mean, if I had see a new patient that had that had previous treatment, I try to get their previous records. Uh, we look at you know all their previous films and everything like that. Like you said, if you're diagnosed with ultrasound, you're getting ultrasounds for for screening off of that. I think that's important too. Uh, if mammogram didn't find anything the first time, then it's probably not going to find anything going forward. So we kind of try to maintain that consistency too. We're going to take one more question. You had said that uh, you're doing more breast conserving uh, surgery than complete mastectomies yeah. and that no difference in mortality survival, survival has been found. Yes. Um, but is there a difference in recurrence? Yes. So if there's a higher recurrence with breast conserving yes. surgery. Just because you have breast tissue still uh, available. I mean, it's not... If, if it was so high that we, uh, you know, if it was a very high degree to the point that uh, people are having a lot of breast recurrences just because of having um, a partial mastectomy or local surgery, we wouldn't be doing it. But uh, if it's approximately 7 to 10%, less than 10% usually, um, then a lifetime recurrence, then we are 0.5 to 1 per year. We... Um, we think that's acceptable as long as we continue with screening algorithms. Um, even with uh, patients who have had mastectomies, we do continue to follow them with physical exams just to make sure that they haven't had any recurrence in the skin. It's still um, a less than 1% chance of having some sort of recurrence in the, in the skin or lymph nodes. So we want to keep seeing patients even if they've had all their breast removed. So, okay, thank you.